Uh, why don't we rise and we'll begin with prayer. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. We give thanks unto you, Lord our God, who has raised us up from our beds and has put into our mouth a, a word of praise, that we may worship and call upon your holy name. We entreat you by your mercies, which you have exercised always in our life. Send down now also your aid upon those who stand before the face of your holy glory and await the rich mercy which is from you. Grant that they may always with fear and love adore you, praise you, hymn you, and worship your inexpressible goodness. For unto you are due all glory, honor, and worship, to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. My hope is the Father, my refuge the Son, my protection the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, glory to you. I place all my hope in you, Mother of God, keep me under your protection. Amen. Please be seated. Scooch up a little bit here. Too far from you guys. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to session two. Uh, today we'll be covering the mystery of holy baptism, sacrament of holy baptism. Remember we said in the first session those two terms were kind of interchangeable, mystery and sacrament. Mystery is more the Greek term, mysterion, and then sacrament is more the Latin term, but they're, both, they're interchangeable. So the mystery of holy baptism, we're going to be talking about birth into the life of Christ. We'll get into that and what that means. Uh, so Orthodox initiation rites, and what I mean by that are, are how does somebody in the Orthodox Church enter into the life of the Church? Uh, most of the time, of course, this takes place with uh, newborn babies, you know, babies. So their baby, babies are born, they have to come into the life of the Church somehow. So there's a few uh, initiation rites actually that take place before the baptism service. So on the day the baby's born, um, there are prayers for a newborn. There's also the service of naming on the eighth day. It's a, I think a common, I would think a common misconception that a child receives its name in the baptism service. This is actually not true. Uh, the child on the eighth day, the tradition is, the custom is that on the eighth day uh, of the child's life, the priest will come to the home or they'll bring the baby, to, well, no, they wouldn't bring the baby to the church because that hasn't been churched yet. But the priest would go to the home and read the prayer of naming. And on that day, the child would receive its name. Uh, then, of course, on the 40th day, we have the churching, where the mother and the child come to the church for the first time. Um, and there's a, a, a short service that kind of brings them back into the life of the church. Uh, again, a common misconception is because this is, you know, we put this 40-day window on the mother and child because the woman is unclean after childbirth, and that's not really the case. The case is that... Uh, the woman and the, needs time to uh, recover from giving birth, which is a very difficult process on the woman's body. And also, the child needs time. Uh, when the newborns are born, their immune system is very weak. And so it's good for them to be home, especially in the beginning, uh, until their immune system strengthen up a little bit. Uh, I learned a couple years ago, having Panayoti for our, in our family, that actually the medical field tells women after birth six weeks to stay home. Well, if you take six weeks times seven days a week, it's 42 days. So it's almost exactly the same as what the medical field tells, uh, tells new moms as well. So it's, it's along the same lines. So you have blessing of the newborn, the naming on the eighth day, and then the 40-day churching. In the ancient church for adult baptisms, there was also a service of the making of the catechumen. Uh, it was a separate, nowadays in the baptism service, it's the first part of the baptism, is the making of the catechumen. That's the part that takes place in the narthex um, before the, the catechesis. And we'll talk about that actually next, next month. This is going to be a, a two sessions on baptism because there's a lot to get through. Um, but in the, for adults in the ancient church, actually there would be a, a process of even becoming a catechumen, which was someone who was learning about the faith. And they would have to bring a sponsor, just like nowadays a, a child comes with the nunor and, and the nuna. They would have to bring a sponsor with them who would, would vouch, basically, that they were coming with the right intentions. And then, um, 
they would have to stand before the bishop, the candidate would have to stand before the bishop, and he would ask them questions about their life. So actually there was like a little bit of an interrogation that would take place by the bishop, not in a mean way, of course, but to kind of see what the person is all about. And then at that point, there would be a prayer of the making of the catechumen, and they would officially enter into the ranks of the catechumens. Um, this isn't really done anymore, at least not in America, not in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, but I think it's an interesting kind of background. And it, it, it finds its way into the baptism service, um, which was what we're going to talk about next month, so I thought I'd bring it up anyway. And so this picture here is a 40-day blessing. It's, 40 day blessings are actually one of my favorite things to do as a priest. It's, it's a lot of it's very joyful. It's a very joyful day uh, for the families and for us priests as well. Um, so in the church, when a new baby comes to enter the life of the church in the sacraments, there's three that take place at once. You have baptism, chrismation, and holy communion. These all take place in the same service. Uh, we do have um, in the modern church, we do have people who are coming from other faith traditions into our, who are being received into orthodoxy. So those who are baptized in other denominations, they may or they may not need to be baptized again. It really depends on what church they're coming from, what faith background they're coming from, and what those church teaches. For example, like uh, converts from Catholicism are, are not required to be baptized. Uh, other jurisdictions, or not other jurisdictions, but other denominations would require um, baptism again. And in case of adult baptism, it would be the same sequence of services as for the child, baptism, chrismation, Holy Communion. Uh, if, if converts are being received by chrismation, that sacrament happens by itself. The baptism has already been recognized, they're chrismated, and then they would come to liturgy uh, on, their, and on a separate day to receive Holy Communion. And that would be their initiation into the church. So basically what we're going to be talking about is not the exceptions. We'll talk about chrismation in a couple months. We're going to be talking about this service of baptism where these three sacraments take place, uh, baptism, chrismation, and Holy Communion. Pre-Christian baptism. So I want to talk a little bit about what baptism was like before Christianity burst onto the scene. So baptism was actually a pretty common practice in ancient religion. Uh, water, of course, is very symbolic of regeneration, of cleansing and purification. And so a lot of ancient faiths also included washing with water uh, in, their, in their traditions as well. So in ancient Egypt, for example, they would baptize children uh, to cleanse them of blemishes, to purify them and to clean them of blemishes uh, from being born. They also, I was reading, there's, they would also baptize uh, dead bodies in the Nile River. Uh, because again, the waters of the Nile, they believed were regenerate, you know, they would, they were, had a, uh, properties of regeneration. And it was some, um, some ritual connected with, uh, the god of death in ancient Egypt. So that's interesting, you know, little tidbit that I, f I found last night actually in my readings. And in ancient Greece, uh, they also, some of the different cults, cause there wasn't like one religion in ancient Greece. They had the pantheon of gods and then different devotions and different practices connected to each of these gods. So in ancient Greece, they would also do immersions um, for purification. And it represented a, a new life, a transformation, and gaining a power. The word baptism itself means to be immersed in something, to be plunged into something. Uh, and we see that, of course, in our baptism, entering the water. And it was the same understanding in the, the ancient world as well, where they would uh, plunge into water um, for this, again, beginning a new life, being transformed, gaining of power. Uh, and all those, all those uh, things as well. So this is, this is something I actually learned now doing research for this session was that there was baptism actually even before um, John the Baptist and, and, and Judaism as well. So we have baptism in the p ancient pagan traditions. We also have uh, pa uh, baptism in Judaism. So the law of Moses requires uh, ritual cleaning for those who have been defiled or after sacrificing. So in ancient... Judaism, there's like 800 ways you can become defiled. Not exactly, but it seems that way. If you, read the, if you read the Old Testament books, there's a lot of ways you can become unclean. One of those ways, for example, is like touching a dead body. If you even like, you know, bump into a dead body, I don't know where you would, that would happen, but if you touch a dead body, you are unclean. So you would have to be cleansed. You would have to be cleaned. Uh, and then there was prayers that would be read over you, and then you would be able to enter into the uh, community life again. Those who were unclean in ancient Israel were like not allowed to come to anything. <laughs> they had to they had to stay home, uh, and sometimes even in like special tents away from their actual dwellings. 
Uh, there's this quote here from Ezekiel, the book of the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. I will sprinkle clean water on you. You will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities. So we, again, we have this idea of water being having cleansing properties, having the power to um, purify, and, and it was the same for the ancient Jews. Baptizing, uh, it became customary also for converts to Judaism. Uh, seven days after their circumcision, because circumcision was a sign, was the, you know, the Judaic sign. If you wanted to be part of the, the tribe, you know, part of the tribes of Israel, you had to be uh, circumcised. That's the rule. So after their circumcision, that was the first thing that would take place. Seven days later, they would be baptized in water. So again, interesting, the things that I, I'm, I'm just learning now about, uh, about baptism. We also have Old Testament prefigurations of Christian baptism. So they have their own baptism practices, but now we have, if we look in the Old Testament, we also see these old stories that kind of prefigure how baptism evolves into Christian baptism. So, for example, we have the creation story. Now, you might say, what does the creation story have to do with baptism? But uh, if you look at Genesis 1-2, this is the second verse of the, of the whole Bible. It says, The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So you have basically this formless and empty void, right? That's the earth. You have this formless and empty. It's really representative of, representative of chaos, right? So God is, the Spirit of God is hovering over this chaos, which is in the waters. And out of this water, God's Spirit will enter in and will form all of creation. We'll put everything in order. And in the same way, of course, in Christian baptism, we have a person, we have a, a person coming to be baptized who is coming from the darkness and is, uh, you know, without Christ and is entering into the water. And out of this water, uh, they will have the light of Christ, you know. So it's the same, the same kind of idea, a creation story, a new life. A new life will come out of the water. In, in Genesis, it's the new life of earth, earth itself. In the baptism, it's the new life of the Christian. We also have the story of the flood. Same concept, right? God floods the earth. The whole earth is covered with water. Everything dies except Noah and his family. And out of this water is a new generation of people. We also have the healing of uh, Naaman the leper. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. In the second book of Kings, chapter 5. And he is a, uh, he is, I believe he's a servant of the king who has leprosy. And leprosy, again, in ancient Israel was like you couldn't enter into a community life. You, had, you couldn't go into the temple. There, it, was very, uh, it was very hard to be someone with leprosy. So he goes to the prophet. The prophet says, go to the Jordan River and wash yourself seven times and you will be healed. And, of course, he is healed in the Jordan River. We see later on Christ comes to the Jordan River, uh, same exact place, and bapti is baptized in the waters. So we have these little hints at what baptism really is going to become from out of this Judaic tradition. Then we have John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he was a rebel. Uh, he, and that's why eventually he was imprisoned and, and, and beheaded. Uh, he is not teach, his baptism is not the same baptism that the Jews were practicing at the time. John comes really with the power of the Word of God. God is the one that sends him on the mission. And he begins baptizing people in the Jordan River, for uh, repentance and forgiveness of sins. Again, if we read the Gospels, we see John's message is, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he calls them into the river, uh, the river Jordan, to be baptized, to be cleansed of their sins, and to begin a new life uh, of holiness and righteousness. So again, this is not the same baptism that the Jews had been practicing beforehand. That was for like kind of entering, entering the life of Judaism, kind of the way that we have baptism in the same way. Um, John now is preaching the forgiveness of sins. And this is kind of where Christian baptism, it all collides and Christian baptism comes out of it. So, we have John the Baptist. This is an example here. Uh, this is an icon of the baptism of Christ. Just to give us an idea of what John was doing at that time. Literally, crowds of people were coming to him to receive this baptism that he was offering for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Mark chapter 1, 4 to 5, we have so. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Again, he's, uh, he's not part of the institution. He appears in the wilderness, uh, preaching a baptism of repentance. 
And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went on to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So this is why we call John the forerunner too. He's preparing the people to receive the word of God in Christ, right? If people are living unrighteous lives, if people are living a life of sin, it will be very difficult for them to accept Christ. Even though Christ meets those people along the way and, and, and touches their hearts, John is trying to prepare the, is Israel, basically. He's trying to prepare them, calling them, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what's that kingdom? That kingdom is Christ, right? Christ is coming. Basically, he's saying Christ is coming, like, prepare yourselves, get ready. Um, be forgiven of your sins and repent so that you can live a righteous life the way that Christ will call you to live a righteous life as well. So John is different. He's, he's, kind, of a new, he's kind of a new idea of what baptism is. And then we have, of course, Christ's baptism, which changes everything again. Uh, the baptism of Jesus by John is another shift in the meaning of uh, the symbolism of baptism. Now, not only do we have the forgiveness of sins, we also have a union with God in Christ, literally being united to him in baptism. And also we have uh, a death and a resurrection that takes place and a new life that is, uh, comes out of it. So this picture here is a picture of a metropolitan in Greece, or a bishop in Greece, who is getting ready to baptize 13 adults into the Orthodox Church. And you can see they're wearing their white uh, robes. And they're gonna, this is the baptismal font that they have in this chapel uh, with baptistry. So I thought that was kind of cool to see that there actually are still baptisms taking place, adult baptisms taking place, catechisms, and people converting to our faith. Uh, and so this is a, a, something I found. Um, I think it was from 2014 or 2015 when this took place. And actually in mission churches, there are like in countries like Guatemala and Kenya and places like that, there are like people being baptized by like, I don't know, like the hundreds. So they're being baptized like in large numbers, which is awesome. So Father Thomas Hopko here is explaining how Christ's baptism kind of changes the practice. Uh, so in the Christian church, the practice of baptism takes on a new and particular significance. It no longer remains merely a sign of moral change and spiritual rebirth. That's John's baptism. Not that it was bad. That's what was needed at the time. Uh, it becomes very specifically the act of a person's death and resurrection in and with Jesus. Christian baptism is man's participation in the event of Easter. It is a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit into the kingdom of God. So we have literally a person now... It's not only changing your life, it's starting a new life. It really is putting the old life behind you and coming into now and beginning a new life in Christ. This is Father Thomas Hopko. What Christ says about baptism. We have a few scriptural uh, teachings of Christ on baptism. This is Mark chapter 16, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That's kind of harsh, you know, that's like a harsh, harsh teaching. Uh, people ask all the time, one of the most common questions I would say is, are people outside of the church, can they be saved? And my response is always, salvation is God's, God's to give, um, not us. So, uh, but this, this passage, again, it's more, I think, more for the emphasis of the importance of being baptized as the, um, as the best way of entering into the life of Christ. We have John, John chapter 3, verse 5, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Water in the Spirit, of course, is a clear reference to baptism. And then Matthew 28, this is the icon also here that we have. Christ's great commission to the disciples, to his disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that's the very end of the book of Matthew, after the resurrection. So, even, you know, Christ, even Christ himself, we have his words and his teachings on why baptism is important and how it brings us into the life of Christ. Okay, any questions so far? Great. Christ's baptism. So in, Christ, in our baptism, in Christian baptism, the story of salvation becomes personal. Last year in our sessions, we talked about the story of salvation, the feasts of the church. Uh, we talked about evangelismos, the Annunciation. We talked about Christ's baptism, the presentation in the temple, uh, his crucifixion and resurrection, his ascension and Pentecost, and all these different feasts of the church, and how this church tells the story of how we are saved as, as people. Uh, in baptism, uh, oh, sorry, excuse me, let me kind of recap for those that were not 
uh, present in last year's sessions. So basically the story of salvation in a nutshell is you have a God uh, in the Bible tells us the story of mankind's fall in which humanity was separated from God. The sin of Adam and Eve separates us from God and drives us down a path leading to death. Right? Without God, there's only one, there's only one end result. Uh, through all these feasts of our church, the story of salvation, we see Christ becoming a human being, and he himself enters into death on the cross so that he can destroy its power over humanity because he is God. And so through Christ, the original, the, the original result of the sin, which is death, is overthrown. And now even though, of course, we all die, uh, we, still, we still have to pass through that. Uh, death has a different... It's not the same anymore. It doesn't have power over us for all eternity. One day we will rise from the dead just like Christ did. Uh, so that's the story of salvation I was referring to. We, also, we experience this personally in our baptism and through all the sacraments, but it starts with baptism. Now, this is a great quote here from St. Gregory Palamas. It says, Do you see that holy baptism is the gate leading those being baptized into heaven? So in other words, when you're baptized, the gate of heaven opens for you. Right? Everything that happened to him, meaning Christ, was for our sake. Therefore, through him, the heavens opened for us. So we have St. Gregory uh, teaching that with baptism, we enter on that road to the kingdom and the gate is open for us. St. Gregory of Nyssa, Cappadocian father, 4th century, the reign of life began with Christ's incarnation, becoming a man, and a new birth took place, a new life, a new form of existence, meaning human even humanity itself is changed because of Christ. Faith is the womb that conceives this new life. Holy baptism, the rebirth, by which it is brought forth into the light of day. So when we have faith in Christ, when we have that faith in Christ in our heart, uh, it's like our, our life, our new life is being ready to be born. Right? It's like a, a child in its mother's womb. And in baptism, the new life is born. Right? The new life is brought into the light of day. St. Gregory of Nyssa. So again, emphasizing that baptism is a birth. It's a new life in Christ. In Christ's baptism, we participate in his death and resurrection. We experience it ourselves. Romans chapter 6. This is St. Paul. This is what's read at the, every baptism service. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So in baptism, going into the water, we die in a way. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Raised up when we come out of the water, we are raised just like Christ is a new person. Newness of life. So in what way are we dying, right? It's not a physical death. We don't actually die when we enter the water. Um, the water is symbolic of that death because we can't live very long underwater. If we stay too long underwater, we actually would die. So entering that water is like a symbolism of, the, of death. Um, but what is it that we are dying to? Because the symbol has to be connected to something. It can't just be a symbol, right? Then it doesn't mean anything. Um, what is dying, though, is our sinful self. We call in the, in the fathers call it the old, the old man. Uh, and the old man meaning the life of sin, the life of, um, of rebellion against God. Uh, that represents our past. And so in baptism, this version of our self this sinful version of ourself is what dies in the font. And so that it, that has to die so that we can rise as a new person, so that the new person can be born by coming out of the water. This experience of death and resurrection unites our life to the life of Christ. I have here an icon of the resurrection. This is from the monastery in Chora in Constantinople, Istanbul. And you see very clearly now Christ raised from the tomb the same way that we are raised out of the water in baptism. And he's bringing with him Adam and Eve out of, their, out of their tombs as well. And so we can picture ourselves in baptism in their place, in Adam and Eve's place. Christ in, in baptism, Christ pulls us out of the tomb itself and gives us a new life in him. St. John Chrysostom, Baptism is to be set free from sins, to reconcile God to man to make man one with God, to open the eyes for souls to perceive the divine ray, 
from the divine son to sum it up to prepare for the life to come so if in the fall of humanity uh, man enters into sin baptism is to be set free from sin if in the fall man and god are at enmity with each other they're not don't, don't get along anymore baptism reconciles god and man if in the fall man is separated from god baptism unites man to god and if in the fall we become spiritually blind uh, in baptism, our souls are open, or the eyes of our souls are opened, so that we can see the light of God, and this is the preparation for eternal life. Let's talk about triple immersion. So, again, I talked a little bit about this already. How the act of being baptized, baptism meaning again being immersed in something, being plunged into something, literally in the ancient Greek, um, is symbolic of death and resurrection we experience in baptism. Of course, again, like I said, we can't breathe underwater. That's the symbolism. That's the material symbolism. Last month we talked about how every sacrament has a material sign and a, and a spiritual meaning that's attached to it. So we have the spiritual sign, the material sign of entering the water. We have the symbolism of our death and resurrection. I really want to hammer that home. And that's why in the baptism service we immerse the person being baptized three times in uh, the water. This, of course, has to do with Christ's three-day burial in the tomb and also is reminiscent of the Trinity. We talked about the Great Commission. Christ says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we do that to this day. We've taken, we've taken Christ's commandment very seriously and we still baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the, the formula. So the servant of God, whatever name it is, is baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And after each person of the Trinity is named, there's one immersion that takes place. So in the name of the Father, the first immersion, in the name of the Son, the second immersion, in the name of the Holy Spirit, third immersion, and then they come out. Uh, there's only a few exceptions. For example, like if a newborn baby is born and has serious medical problems, um, and they're not sure if the baby's going to live, you're not, obviously you're not going to take that very fragile baby and dunk it in water three times like you'd be threatening its life so um, there are some exceptions or if somebody who was very old wanted to come into the faith and convert to orthodoxy but they were very weak you know like it would be very difficult to make that happen in those cases you know there's special directions i've never dealt with them myself so i'm not i've never really had to look into what those things are i've heard of like baptisms taking place just like in the air basically without the water um, for for children who are who may uh, die as newborns um, or like sprinkling of water on the on, chi on children or things like that there's only a few exceptions really for us you, you got to go in the water whether it's all the way under or whether you go in and you get splashed all over the place so the water has to go everywhere it has to be you have to go into the water there's no way out. you can't go you can't half die you can't half go in the tomb and half stay out of the tomb you got to go in all the way so there's a little bit of a long quote here from Bishop Godley. So this is on your sheets um, if you have it with you. So he says, there's no doubt about the true Orthodox teaching. Immersion is accept essential, except in emergencies. For is there, if there is no immersion, the correspondence between the outward sign and the inward meeting is lost, and the symbolism of the sacrament is overthrown. So in other words, if you don't baptize in water by immersing in water, the meaning of the, of the sacrament itself, the symbolism of the sacrament is completely lost. We lose it. Uh, baptism signifies a mystical burial and resurrection with Christ. We already talked about that. The outward sign of this is plunging the candidate into the font, followed by the, immersion from the or emergence from the water. Sacramental symbolism, therefore, requires immersion or burial in the waters of baptism and resurrection out of them once more. Baptism by infusion, when the water is merely poured over part of the body, is permitted in special cases. But baptism by sprinkling or smearing is quite simply not real baptism at all. So this is one of the differences when we talk about like the different Christian denominations. This is one of the things that separates us from other, from other denominations, like um, you know, Catholic and, and Protestant denominations. Um, they do baptism differently. Uh, but for us, the immersion in the, in the, in the font is, is very important. Any questions on this as well? Infant baptism. So uh, not every church does infant baptisms uh, either. Some do, some do, but uh, let's talk a little bit about why we baptize uh, babies. So why do we baptize infants? Well, we might 
wonder, you know, like I've heard before, like, well, in the early church, it was adult, it was more adult baptism. And then they changed to as, as those Christians were having children, they had to adapt to the service to infants. But this is really is not true. Uh, infant baptism has been part of the life of the church since the beginning. We see in, in the life of Christ, Christ is very clear. He says, let the little children come to me. You know, he's not, he's not a, against the, the little children being a part of the life of, of his life and therefore the life of the church. And we have two stories in the book of Acts that show entire families being baptized. The first one is Cornelius. Cornelius is the one who sees the vision of St. Peter coming. And he's, he's a Roman uh, official. And he sends for St. Peter, and St. Peter catechizes him and his family, teaches him the go- uh, about the gospel of Christ, and he baptizes his whole household is baptized. Uh, and the Holy Spirit descends on them. So that's one example. The second one is in Acts chapter 16. We have the Philippian jailer. So this is with uh, St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul's in prison. There's a big earthquake uh, that takes place, and the uh, jails are open. And this jailer... He's getting ready to kill himself because he's like, oh, they're going to kill me anyway because all these prisoners are going to escape. And St. Paul says, well, we're all here. Don't kill yourself. Um, and he teaches him about Christ. And this person, this Philippian jailer, he, uh, as we see here in, in Acts 16, 33, it says he took them, meaning St. Paul took them the same hour of the night, washed their, or the jailer took them at the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. So we have two cases in Acts where whole families are baptized we can't assume that this did not include um, small children as well. And here we have the icon of the little children coming to Christ uh, in the Gospels, which is always a kind of a beautiful image of Christ with uh, his people. We also have textual evidence from the 3rd and 4th century that refers to infant, bap- infant baptism, including St. John Chrysostom. Part of the reason they did it, infant baptism in the beginning, was because infant mortality was, a really, high, was really high back then. So it was very common for children to die, either very young or in birth or, you know, and things like that. So they would baptize them uh, as young babies. And as we see St. Gregory, Gregory the Theologian, I think we hit all the Gregories today. We had St. Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory Palamas, and now Gregory the Theologian. St. Gregory the Theologian says it's better for infants to be sanctified without being aware of it than for them to leave this world unsealed and unbaptized. So what he's referring to is uh, how some people think that, uh, you know, children should be able to or should have to kind of grow up and become intellectually aware to understand the faith before they can become baptized and enter in the life of the church. But that's never really been a part of our, our tradition. Again, this is another difference like you see between Orthodoxy and Catholicism where the Catholics baptize as babies, but then confirmation, which we do as chrismation, takes place later after a, a catechism, after education. Uh, for them, there's an intellectual aspect of it that kind of is important um, for entering the life of the church. For us, in the East, it was never really a part of the equation. For us, uh, baptism was not an intellectual exercise. The life of a Christian was not necessarily an intellectual exercise. But it's really a, an expression of life, uh, of life, the, the life of faith in Christ. And this life of faith goes back to our earliest days. Uh, and in the Orthodox Church, that's why we baptize, and not only baptize, but we chrismate and give communion, and they become a full member of the church, even as infants. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? I hope I'm uh, making sense. So, Father Anthony here, Conyeris, we bring infants to baptism not because they believe, but in order that they might believe. Baptism is like the planting of the seed of faith in the human soul. Baptism introduces the child to the love of God and opens him to the grace of the Holy Spirit. These are great riches, even if the child is unaware of them at the beginning. To deny a child baptism is to deprive him of this inner grace that is so necessary to Christian growth. So in the gospel, we heard this today, right, about soil and planting seeds. So baptism is the way that this, a child, you know, their heart becomes soft and, and fertile for the word of God to come and dwell within them. And that's why it's important for us that we not only baptize, but chrismate and give communion from the earliest days of our lives. Uh, infants are not baptized. Oh, yeah, another note here on original sin. Infants, or adults for that matter, are not baptized because of original sin. When I say original sin, uh, what I mean is kind of the Western understanding of original sin, which is that we inherit in our birth the sin of Adam and Eve. Um, which, of course, is known as the doctrine of the original sin. This is not a doctrine of the Orthodox Church. 
We do not in our birth inherit Adam and Eve's sin. I am born 10,000 years after, probably millions of years after they lived. It was not my sin. I didn't touch the fruit. It's not my fault. I, the sin is not on me. What I have inherited, though, is the result of the sin. So Adam and Eve goofed in the beginning and they ate the tree, right? They sinned. They turned away from God. They rebelled. And that had a big impact on human existence, right? Especially sickness and pain and death. That's what I have to deal with as a Christian living in the modern world. I, I know that throughout my life I will have pain. I know that throughout my life I will suffer. I know that throughout my life I will get sick. And eventually one day I will die. This is the, what we call the, original, the effect of original sin of Adam and Eve. Uh, and that's what we have to deal with. In baptism, baptism directly addresses that. right? Because all those things, pain and suffering and death and sickness come from separation from God, especially death, especially eternal death, right? Complete separation from God. Baptism unites me to God so that even in my life when I suffer and when I, I'm sick and when I die, I do it with Christ who will give me power to overcome all of those things, including death itself. Uh, so that's another difference a little bit between our church and some of the other churches. So we don't baptize because of original sin. In baptism, the original sin of Adam and Eve is not washed off of you. It's, it's now that you are being united to Christ so that you can overcome the result of Adam and Eve's sin. Okay, I'll wrap up there. We're a little bit over. Are there any questions about baptism? I'm going to continue next month. There's more. There's more to it. And there's even more that I'm not, I can't get to because we could have a whole class just on baptism. There's so much there. Uh, any questions before we depart? Yes. So in, uh, in a situation where people fall away from the faith and maybe go to one of the Protestant denominations, they are almost always baptized as if nothing happened before that. Uh, what's the basis for that? If they believe the same with the biblical notion of baptizing... You're saying when they leave the Orthodox Church yes. to go into the Protestant Church, they're baptized again? Yeah, so that happens not, or born again or, or, or whatever. Right, yeah. Um, do they, in other words, they have a, is it just because they feel like doing they it? Just don't, they, they, just, they, they just don't recognize <laughs> that baptism is valid as part of their life of their church. And again, for us, not all baptisms are accepted. You know, if, if a church does not preach the Trinity and the person is baptized and they come to Orthodoxy, we baptize them again because they're not baptized in the name of the Trinity like we do. Um, so it really just depends on what, where they're coming from. So, you know... I'm not familiar enough with the life of these different, you know, there's like 39,000 Christian denominations, so I'm not familiar with even, you know, a hundred of them enough to say what they're, where they're coming from, theologically speaking, but it comes down to that they don't recognize our baptism as being valid. That's, that's what it comes down to. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you all for being here. A great crowd today, so I appreciate it. And uh, next month we'll continue uh, with baptism and we may get to Christmas, start Chrismation as well. Thank you. God bless. Αφούς και νεκρώσεις φούν και κράτησεν Ως γαρ ζωής μητέρα προς την ζωή μετέστησεν Ο μητρά νικήσας αϊπάς